Hey, what's up? It's Michael Rinder, a.k.a. Killer Mike, Killer Kill from the Ville. And I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastard. My mama dead, my, mama my dead. grandmama dead. To keep it honest, I get depressed and be feeling scared. Yes, sir, yes, sir. We right back at it, y'all. We got a special one here for you. We got the legend, Killer Mike, jumping off the porch with us today. What's yeah. up with you, bro? Man, happy to be here, Smith. I just got a duck, y'all. I done fucked around, left all my hey, dope at home. Man, so come on, man. Part unk for being on the porch just for the Man, it's all good. Look, man, <laughs> my, one of my favorite rappers, Devin the Dude, had the song Doobie Ass Track. Oh, man. Come on, man. What you going to do Ooh, when the people me? go home? Oh, man. <laughs> so, man, look, we it's all gone and come, come, somebody had the, the nerve, nerve to, to take my up out the Doobie Ass Track. Why they do me that? Way. Way. He's on. one of my favorite stylers, man. Bruh. Like the singing, the rapping, the, the, the fusion of everything yeah. from the Dale Phonics to the dope boy shit. Absolutely. I love that, uh, man. man. My, I love when he's part of Odd Squad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like, yeah. him and Blind Rob. Yeah, yeah straight yeah. up. Yeah. Come on, come man, on. Rap A Lot has given us a lot of memorable shit, man. Oh, yeah, and, man. And Classics, Devin is, man. Devin but is. Devin was, I mean, and I mean, to me, he, you know, I consider him like the rap Richard Pryor. You know what I'm saying? So I was in, I was in the crib, like, sneaking listening to Richard Pryor and then you know later on when Devin came out that Sorry. was my true refuse to that like where I could relate to that I'm laughing this yeah. cat talking about drinking brews and you know I, I'd encourage like you know if you're young in the game like I know what's winning around you you know how to do and emulate but man go search some classic shit might not nobody be up on yeah and man I, I was country as a motherfucker might not nobody be up on like <laughs> go do that get the Devons, the Odd Squads, get Poison Clan yeah get um Man, oh man, I get get. Oh, I'm trying to trying to think of so, so no, many classics. Yeah, yeah, man, but but I'm man. just saying like get records that other people don't and get yeah. and develop a, a style around it. Yeah, like at the end of the uh, day, absolutely. it's style that's gonna always make you the shit in rap. So go find some styles, get influenced. Yeah, by. no, for sure. I mean, it, and it's funny, you know, like us even starting out talking about Devin. I mean, you know, in in the same realm of being an artist who is like, you know been considered underground, but then well known and well respected, you know, by people, you know, within the mainstream or yeah. within the A-listers, all that, you know, you fall right into that category, yeah. you know what I mean? It's an honor to be, it's yeah. an honor, it's an honor to, to, uh, to be respected by your peers, like Andre 3000 and Gabe Devin, there's a lot of motherfuckers begging for a stack first, so he didn't have an effect on some of the greats. Look to see who the people who the people you admire, admire and show love to, like, right. I'll, I'll appreciate Kendrick forever for that compliment because it validated a lot of people who argue on my behalf in the barbershop. Yeah, nah, for sure. In a barbershop in America somewhere right now, somebody saying Killer Mike's my top five. Nah, absolutely. And, and there's a nigga saying, nigga, you crazy. And a nigga saying, nigga, what Kendrick said. And the other nigga got to shut the fuck man, up. Man, real shit. So, I mean, because <laughs> that's, I mean, but, but that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about too, man. Like from, you know, like, critical acclaim yeah. or, you know what I'm saying, being, what do they call it, a cult classic yeah. or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you, you, you're you in that category, you yeah. in those barbershop conversations about, okay, who's one of the best? Who's yeah. the top lyricist in this thing? Well, I'm gonna tell you what's about to stop, the overlook part, yeah. uh, underrated. Mm -hmm. I got a new album called Michael um, and it, it is it is unadulterated. It's a, you know, it's what it's supposed to be yeah. in these times. It's, right. a, it's a generational statement and I'm proud to, to um to showcase that man if you know if you keep at this shit much like in a Devin and Bun and mm -hmm. face like way much like in a KRS or Kane type way you can keep it sharp you know what I mean yeah uh, I've I've managed to make um I've managed to make a, my most personal classic you know a tribute to me black maledom black masculinity mm. working class black or white or any other color mm -hmm. maledom and you know, for I, this is for the working class man and the women who love him, his mother, his wife, his lover, yeah. his kids, you know, you know, this is for us. Right. And, and the people, if you want to know well, who's us, listen to this. And at the end of it, you're going to feel something. You feel something, you us. If right. not, you're not us. Yeah, and you know, you blessed us with, um, I guess if you want to call it like a maxi single or whatever, where you dropped a single like or the small EP. Yeah, we dropped like where, four records. So yeah, and, and just in Killer Mike fashion, you took us, you know, across the gamut, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You had Talking That Shit, yeah. which, you know what I'm saying, produced by DJ Paul, you know, just giving you that true essence of, you know, that, that feel and that vibe that we come from, you know what I'm saying, with, from Triple Six and all that. Yeah. Then you, you know, took it to the personal side with, you know, uh, Motherless Absolutely. and, you know what I'm saying, really 
touched on some really heartfelt um, subject. Well, I mean, the entire song was a heartfelt, Absolutely. you know, subject matter. And then, um, and then even other song, was it Don't Let the Devil? Or? Don't Let the Devil. Then yeah. Short for Don't Let the Devil Coerce You. Right. And one, the very first one that started last July 4th was um, Intro by Dave Chappelle, featured Young Thug. Oh, yeah, Run. Free Thug, and it's called Run. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and Run was not about running from something, but running towards something. Hmm. You know, all we talk about is running from the police or from a problem and not running from an awkward. Man, think about putting a goal and running toward that shit as an individual and then as black people. When you collectively do that, amazing shit happens. And I know on the other side of this, you know, people think, you know, man, that I'm talking that dream shit or that shit that niggas sell you on the internet, but I'm not. I'm a product of it, yeah. of, of it working. We, right here on Fulton Industrial, you know, we recording this right now. Absolutely. I grew up a bike ride from here in a neighborhood called Adamsville and the Collier Heights neighborhood. All black neighborhood, they gentrified, pushed poor white people out in 1946. And everybody lived in that neighborhood from poor working class folks, um, working class folks like my grandparents to the richest black person in Southeast Herman Russell. You know, senators lived in that neighborhood. So my, neighbor, my school was black, went to Frederick Douglass High School, then Morehouse College. My entire life was about black pride and confidence. And I'm talking about pride in everything from a street nigga driving a box Chevy to the fact that Cynthia McKinney grew up in my same neighborhood and if she was a politician, I could be too. So mm -hmm. the whole black gambit and spectrum. So when I be talking, I don't be talking on hope and I don't ask you for no donations at the end. Yeah. You know, and if I ask for a donation, it ain't for me. It's to an organization that's actually doing the work. Yeah. You know, so I'm happy to be all things that this city has been both good and bad. You know, and I'm glad the musically and Michael, what I give you is this little nine year old boy sitting in Kaya Heights Elementary, little buck tooth boy with horns and a halo. He yeah. was mischievous. He was, he, was, he was brilliant and at the same time just loved that ratchet ass bad shit. Yeah. And um, this album, Show You the Gambit, very first song on there is called Down By Law. Okay. If you are old Atlanta head, you know, tell your nephews and nieces what that mean. Because I named it that because I was inspired by that. It, it was a time where Atlanta wasn't the tip of the spear. We was, you know, the little brothers and sisters to other cities that thankfully got it going. Uncle Luke and what he and the Two Live Crew did for Miami. Mm -hmm. Man, they set it up for the region. What Tony Draper and Suave House did, right. what Paul and Juice did in Memphis, what Jay Prince did, you know, in Houston, what, you know, from Baby and Slim to Percy and what they was doing in New Orleans, man, it was just inspiration all around us. Atlanta finally kind of figured it out. And I wanted to sh make sure that, like that little boy that grew up in this city, mm -hmm. with this city, that you got a chance to see all of him and all of that wow. you know, in his glory. So Down By Law, first record feature CeeLo Goody, Right there, intro you all the way to the end with High and Holy, yeah. which features one of our um, Ephi sisters giving a, a, a prayer um, in our native tongue, just that our ancestors are always look over us. And then everything in between is an audio movie. According, I had sent it to Jay-Z. That's what he hit me back with. He, uh -huh. he hit me back with, I love it, and a bunch of exclamation points. And then he said, wow. he said, really, man, I was like, going to my aunt's house watching the movie. You know you kid, you know that little auntie who smoked weed. And yeah. My mama, my mama was that auntie. You can come to our house, watch cable, she let you watch Richard Pryor. She didn't give a damn, you yeah. know, she, she just made sure she wanted to make sure you understood mm -hmm. it. So yeah, it, it's that and it's, um, and it's dope. Yeah, no, that's what's up, man. Now about Adamsville, man, can you tell us like when you jumped off the porch? I, I, I was never on the, the porch per se uh -huh. as, I'm from a country family. So, you know, shit, man, I grew up seeing a lot of crazy. When you country, you see, you see, man, you see people kill animals and eat it. You see, you know yeah. what I mean? The porch, it was a harder porch. I mean, we thought we had it hard in Atlanta because, you know, we had to ride the bus, risk getting raw, five joints, that kind of shit. But when your grandparents or parents drop your ass off in the middle of Tuskegee, Alabama, hmm. and you see your great grandma, I probably, I remember my dog got at a chicken. My great grandmama came, I went and said, big mama, big mama, dog at the chicken. She came outside, shot the dog, pam, shot the dog. Yeah. See what your face is did? Shot the dog in the ass. The dog skittered. It wasn't her dog. The dog skittered across. We on about we we on um we on about thirty acres. Yeah. She picked up the chicken. Fop. Next thing you know, the head of the chicken and the chicken running around. The chicken's nerves a little long yeah, after that. Yeah. She said, "Go fetch me some water." I went right past the well. My little chub ass waddling. Get to the little lake or pond, and we got out there and tell my cousin, you know, big pond went crazy. She just shot the dog. She killed the chicken. She finna kill her. Man, by. It's at 3 4 o'clock, that chicken went on the table. She uh. hit that chicken, hit that hot water, got plugged, gutted, yeah. clean. And uh, I remember spazzing. Yeah, I'm a sickly child, I'm car. And like they say in the country, car, I got asthma and shit. So taking me down there already be a chore. Man, and I told my big mom, I'm not even my friend. <laughs> oh, man. So, oh, man. And she, she, she laughed and 
she ended up making me, you know, eat enough. But afterwards, and I remember when the older folks got back from Montgomery, they bring you ice cream and little treats. For and um, my, my great grandmother, you know, Truzella Blackman, fed me ice cream and started explaining to me that life, this is what life is. Mm -hmm. So I was never on the porch and that there was ever some innocence about life and death and shit like that. My cousins, you know, at that time the crack era rolling in, my cousins were either selling and or doing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. My mother was an artist, but she was a businesswoman. She was a florist by nature, but she understood if I'm, these white women paying $5,000 for this floor arrangement, shit, if they need a quarter brick to take their ass through a quarter of the year, I'm going to get that for them too. So my mother was only 16 years older than me, so she never really hid stuff from me. Hmm. You know, if I asked her what it was, she was going to tell me what it was meant for and why it wasn't meant for a child. So yeah. I've never really been on the porch. I was off the porch because I was Denise's son. Huh, word. You know, so you, I, yeah, you, you was born in the game, born yeah, in the Yeah, and, and now how niggas say I was in the game. You know, my mom didn't want me, you know, fucking drug deal. She was disappointed as fuck when I asked her to take me to my aunt's boyfriend, yeah. and, you know, to buy a pound because I didn't want to work. Shit, I wanted to got them sell weed. All oh, these niggas smoking mid in my house. It ain't yeah. no way I should be able to, you know, but, but she said if you're going to be out there, you're not going to be out there to be stupid and you're not gonna be nobody's bitch. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have no nigga front you something and you sitting on the nigga trying to get your picture took. Mm -hmm. So she, she was very vehement. She was real cold in a way. And, I, and let me qualify this. The woman who's telling me this, this ain't just your mama saying something. You know, my mama, you know, my mom was 15 years old, two weeks before my birthday. Mm -hmm. And come off on Channel 2 News, woman um, attempting to buy 10 kilos of cocaine in Griffin, Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, and when she, when I finally asked her about it years later, thank God her man, my man Ralph, he, he literally said, I beat her. She do what I tell her to do. It, it's all mine. He took the charge for everybody, for him and his woman. And he went and served the time, which let my mama come back home to us. But my mama, she got out, I'll never remember, I'll never forget her saying, lying ass crackers, it was 20. They just kept half the money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's so, that's so G. <laughs> hey, that was the first time I realized my grandmother just didn't believe in Jesus. You know, I, I remember my grandmother, you, they call it the root lady, but you really, you're just talking about a priestess of some of you or for Eva or even what people call voodoo. I, I realized that my grandmother had a, had a connection that was past just the Bible because hmm. well, she wanted my mom to get a bond or bail or just get out of it. I remember going to this, this house in the country. I remember my grandmother going in. I remember we sitting there, and my granddad might have knew late because he got us there. And I remember seeing a chicken run without a head. So I was like, oh, okay, it's like my great grandma. <laughs> so, but that chicken didn't get cooked. <laughs> so, and I remember my grandmother coming back with this package of candles to buy her instructions. And her daughter came home in two weeks, you wow. know. So I, I've had a, an amazing black experience, you know. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, it, and I thank God. I didn't understand any of it until, until I understood it. But now I understand. You know? Word. No, nah, that's ill. I mean, that's like a dope, diverse, you know what I'm saying, way to come up. I mean, I know you also said that you, you know, like were a part of like working elections, like since you yeah, were Yeah, so I was like five well. years old. Yeah. So, so the side of town we're on, this is the west side of Atlanta. It's not to be confused with southwest Atlanta. Okay. And that's not to put a wedge or division, but southwest Atlanta was originally, it, it, was, it was more well-to-do white folks. So just notice, so well-to-do white folks don't like niggas next to poor white folks. Hmm. So, so when the well-to-do white yeah. folks, when black folks, integration happened, black folks start saying, we gonna move to Southwest Atlanta. <laughs> well-to-do white folks like, no, they, they really threatened to build a wall. Oh, wow. But the west side of Atlanta is the bottom of Northwest Atlanta. And Northwest Atlanta is wealthy and white, but right in this little cushion, right in this little rub between where the old Perry Home was, Collywood Road, Gun Club Road, and right at, you know, old High Tower, Carney Drive, Martin Luther King, North Martin Luther King, there's just this enclave that's just densely black. Hmm. It's just black, you know. Hmm. And that's why I grew up. And, and, and growing up there, Andy Young was running for mayor. He had been congressman, he had been U.S. ambassador. Yeah, my grandfather was a fan of Maynard, who was before Andy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just like some people try to critique my OG to this day, I love Andy. They said my grandfather said he liked he like white folks too. Yeah. Well, what Andy understood is that cooperation and collaboration went a lot further. Hmm. My grandmother, who's a member of the SCLC, really believed in Andy. So the first election I work on, I'm just at the hem of her garment, knocking on folks doing Perry Home, asking them to vote Andy for mayor. And yeah. Andy said to me years later, and man, I, I wish my grandmother had been here to hear it. He said, your side of town is the reason I won the election. Mm -hmm. And he might have been talking about Congress, because by mayor, everyone trusted him. But yeah, I've been doing this involuntarily because that's what you did you did whatever your mama said and my yeah. grandma was my mom yeah. and i did exactly what she said i took my ass i knocked i tried to convince people to vote for the candidate mm -hmm. so by the time you fast forward to say you know getting the people to vote for bernie sanders i knew what i was doing because i had been seasoned in the field right you know? right 
Yeah, and, and so many people were so surprised, I think, to see you, um, you know, in that position and, yeah. and, and doing that. But it's interesting because, like, if, if you were a real fan of the music, if you were a real hip hop head, yeah. then, I mean, I knew, like, when, when you came out, I think it was about, like, 03, 04, something like that. I remember, like, I specifically remember because you and David Banner dropped, yeah. like, right around the same yeah. time. Both of y'all first That's albums dropped. Yeah, and so, and both of y'all are like some of my favorite rappers yeah. and, and, and are on the tip of where it's street, it's self-conscious, yeah. it's, you know, it, it, it taps into politics yeah. and being conscious in that realm. And, and, and it's fly and cool. Yeah. That was everything yeah. y'all embodied. Which yeah, you just was, described a Southern black man. Hey, and, <laughs> and, 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 and that's how I always felt Absolutely. like I was. And that's how, when y'all came out, I was in college. And Absolutely. you know what I mean? That was my sound, y'all was my soundtrack, you know what I mean, getting through. And I went to a PWI, so like y'all definitely gotcha. <laughs> was my soundtrack to like even just get through them days or whatever. But, um, but yeah, but interesting enough, bro, like with, you know, you being known in certain realms as outcast homies. Yeah, I was, you, I was their protege. Yeah. I, I, don't, I do not run from that. Like, definitely, yeah. I'm a protege of outcast. Can, proud can, you, of can you actually uh, tap into like how you connected with those guys? And Morehouse. How about? I, went to, I went to Morehouse and I met in the CeeLo Reddick, not to be confused with CeeLo Green. The CeeLo Reddick is one half of the Beat Bullets who created the hit Kryptonite. Okay. Produced for Chameleon Air, produced for Outcast. I mean, mm -hmm. produced for Big Boy, produced for me. CeeLo, man, is his, the son of Bonzo and Betty Reddick. Bonzo being uh, a well-known civil rights and just lawyer in Savannah, and his mom, Betty, being a hell of a Spanish teacher. I think she taught my wife. <laughs> yeah. um, they were from Savannah. Okay. And you know how, like, CeeLo is one of those middle-class kids who never looked himself above anyone. He's just a great kid, great parents. And, you know, big boy coming out of a project like Fraser Holmes, he was that friend that you inspires you. You know, he's your friend whose parents got it together, they got it together, and they inspire you to do better. He's, he's um, and not do better like you're doing bad, but go for the big things in life. Mm -hmm. And they had a great, they have a great friendship. And I was just his homeboy's homeboy and his brother's homeboy, Lil James, right. who, who um, is responsible for the dog empire. Like okay. you, you buy one of them $80,000 got there right. or whatever, <laughs> that's, that's Lil James who's yeah, a brilliant yeah. kid. Yeah, them bullies. Yeah, James, we had James and Sharif down at um, Morris Brown. Um, oh, man, Mike Flo was over at Clark, I think, just cutting hair, and then mm -hmm. it was us at Morehouse, and we just hung. And you know, and my man Rock D, who wrote and brought Kryptonite, uh, he was a year younger, he came up later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I met Big through that. I met Big through selling my Slumlord CD, which I had pressed up with me and Big Zach from Adamsville. His brother Giants got one and right. gave it to Big. Shout out to Big like, Zach. And Big was like, hey man, I, I fuck with this, whoever this, this, this Slumlord, whoever this one is, yeah. I fuck with him. And then he heard more music that me and CeeLo were working on. And he told me, he said, man, me and Trey working on something. That was the original deal with Electra, what Slim was. And he was like, um, and I'm gonna holler at you. And I'm, at this point, I got a few pounds of marijuana. I got a square job. And I'm just like, man, I'm gonna fuck around and die. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. this shit ain't going right. Yeah. And um, the same year I would end up graduating big, offered me a um, record deal. Wow. So I regret dropping out of Morehouse to chase the dream because Instead of buying cars and wheels and shit, I bought music equipment, and I made sure we could we could do it. And yeah. um, but I but I do not regret um, for a day meeting Big Boy, staying in a humble place, not trying to push or rush, but just waiting on my turn. So yeah. one night I get a call in the middle of the night. I'm um, I'm fucking with a little chick named Cash, um, working Jazzy T. I had got familiar with Decatur. See, I'm from the West Side. A lot of people don't know when you're from the West Side, it ain't like you get to Decatur a lot. They diametrically, they opposites, you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like It's like a Brooklyn cat going to Harlem. Like, yeah, it, just, it, it just don't, it don't, yeah. not that you don't have cousins, not that you don't right. have, but in terms of hanging, I literally yeah. would hang in the West and then hang in the cater. Cause I went to my mom's house on weekends, all my partners out there, instead of going to Doug, like on the West, they went to Southwest to cab. So I had just as many partners, but my, um, I was messing around with this little girl in the strip club, like all early rappers do, you yeah. know? <laughs> and um, Big them wanted to go to Jazzy T's. They, they didn't know. You know, they from the South Side. They never go to Decatur. Gotcha. You know what I mean? They didn't know the Decatur scene. I was as known as Jazzy T as I am in the Blue Flame. So I hit them and let them know, hey, I'm going to bring Outcast out here tonight. Listen, make sure everything cool. DJ Funky was DJing out there okay. at that time. Shout Funky introduced Funky. me to, to Gooch. You know what I mean? The okay. Gooch, like, like right. real shit, man. Like, and when we were both on the come up, so shout out to Funky. But man, we went out there and man, the, the, I told Cash, you get the best girl and let's just get them a hell of a time. And then v, they, they turned that VIP out. Like, so right. wherever you at, babe, thank you. You know what I mean? Cause, we ain't messed around too long after that, but I really appreciate it. she she 
she gave it all she had in the homegirls, and we came. When people wonder why we salute and give so much love to strippers, because it's a social scene. They like right. the diplomats, or the or the um, the, like the, like like they can move around. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, and, and oftentimes they'll leave a good 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 word on your name. Yeah. But um, we had a great time, and we got back to the studio. Big said, "Shit, we got this, man. We finished the album, but um." Just see if you can do something to this. And they left the mic on and they didn't know I could hear him. And so his crew don't know me from a can of paint. And man, you could just hear the dog, man, who that fat ass nigga am yeah, I? That nigga my bro. Man, this west side, you let this nigga nigga from the west side. <laughs> hey, and I'm goddamn. I'm laughing because I'm like, nigga, I'm in here. Now I can't, I, I'm not going backwards. And uh, some of them say dudes, man, my best of friends now. And uh, but we were doing what young men do. Yeah, yeah. I, I said that first line, man. I shit don't mix like yeah and loot warm water, and it was over. Everybody yeah. shut the fuck up. And when I walked out that booth, it was a radically different atmosphere. Man, cause yeah. I mean, when you came in on that snapping and trapping, yeah. like that was. I mean, did you all right? Did you know that you were gonna be first on the song? I didn't know where I was gonna be. I just knew I was gonna take that motherfucker somewhere. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I literally. If you know somebody who can cook dope, lukewarm water, it ain't gonna, but you got to get that bitch up to 400 degrees, yeah. like Juve told you. Yeah. So if you were sophisticated, you got it. You understood if you've been there. And it just, man, that, that motherfucker, huh. I knew I had caught. Yeah. A moment. You, you said another line on there, you said something about, uh, man, what you say, uh, something about a, 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 a murderous city, Sergeant Slaughter. Or yeah, something. <laughs> a murder city, Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. I ought to kidnap your infant daughter. So soldier ass niggas on Murder City, Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, man, that, 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 was, that was my joint, bro. Um, so how much pressure was it, did you feel, going in the studio and, and, and doing that? And well, I mean, it wasn't no pressure, man. Right. I knew I was made for the moment. Yeah. You know, real shit. The pressure be just figuring out the style, hmm. how I want to do it. But I ain't never worried about what the outcome's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, man. Go I'm, listen to my features. You know, y'all, you know, y'all watch y'all. I might say, I might not have paid much attention to Mike, man. Go listen to Good Morning with me, Pusha T, and uh, and the boy, uh, my boy Black Thought. Go, oh yeah. Yeah. Go go listen to me on Popping Tags. Go listen to me. Go go oh, yeah. listen to when I when I'm called. I'm not not popping up to play or bullshit. Yeah. You know what I mean. Speaking of Popping Tags, I wanted to ask you, um, were you were you in the studio recording? Nah, that? Man. okay. I, I, what, what was beautiful if you listen to it, they clipped me. I was originally right behind Jay. Okay. They clipped. I think my love somebody I live in there. They got twisted in between us. I, I always, you know, my my ego was like nigga, cause you went crazy, nigga. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? But man, I appreciate Jay to this day, even the compliment he gave me on this album. But he's always been cool and accessible. And, and, and just a gentleman, him and Ty. Yeah. Ty, you know, just always been a gentleman. The whole Rockefeller regime was very nice and kind to me. You know, as a stranger in another place, you, you appreciate that. But um, the crazy part about Papa Tags is we were on the bus, we were on the tour bus. This was still when Black Bear, I guess, it had the things you flipped open and whatever they used to call those. Okay, yeah. And, no. um, and B said, hey, man, he said, huh? The two way joint? Or yeah, it might have been the two way joint okay. or it might have been a, even a, the, the flip. Or the sidekick joint. The sidekick, right? Yeah. Yep. So, we there and um, it's crazy because Torn hits me. He said, hey, he said that boy Ho just called. He said, um, he wants you on this song. And I'm looking like confused. He said, yeah, he said, at first I thought he was talking about me and Drake. He, I said, I was telling him Drake not really, you know, doing features probably when, you know, me and the poppy. He said, no, 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 I'm talking about the young boy y'all got. That boy, that boy Killer Mike. So I'm just like, oh shit. This is when I still was sometimes right. I go to the back of the bus, I just start getting out ideas once they told me. And then when I found out Kanye was doing it, I was already a fan of what he was doing. You know what I mean? It was just, you know? Right. And um, the, cool, the cool shit was, I, I got it laid, but I got a chance to go in the studio and just kind of fuck around and holler at Jay. Shanti Dawes, shouts out to Shanti Dawes and what she's doing. She comes out of the executive world of um, LaFace and, and out of the Columbia system. Yeah, yeah. But now she's pivoted that organizational skill to mental health and helping mm -hmm. people get that together. So y'all support Shanti Dawes, S-H-A. And T I D A S. But yeah, but yeah. Shanti, Shanti said Jay wants to Silence meet you. Silence the Shame, I think, is the name of her organization mm -hmm. or something like yep, that. Yep, Silence the Shame. Yep. Exactly. Shouts yep. out to Silence the yep. Shame. Yep. Let's Silence support. And I mean support. Don't, you know, them, them $5 you're going to spend on Switchers, $10, that's send to her. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm doing it too. But um, Sid said, said, Jay hit me and he wants you to come out through the studio. Well, I knew I wasn't going to record it there, but she was like, you still need to meet him. And I'm like, all right, bet. So 
This when I arrived, this nigga is a pro. Like we parked somewhere, this nigga sent the truck to pick us up. And we just like gonna put this shit like a scene from Ozark. I'm just like, what the fuck? And we get there, man, and um, I think it might have been a Malik Sezi jersey, it was, it was a basketball jersey or something like that, but he was so cool and such a gentleman and just like, hey, yeah, I, I asked you to do it because I think you'll be able to. And it was very quick, so you know, but it gave me some sensibilities of how to handle yourself as a gentleman in the game. Yeah. It gave me some sensibility of what he wanted from the record. I went home and splashed the record. So, if, you know, if you ever get asked a half million to Jay Z, you know, it's a hard decision, but I ain't gonna blame me either way because right. I ain't gonna lie. I took the little game I got from him and the way I've maneuvered through the industry is in big part from watching him as a gentleman. Word. So I, I picked up, I, I'd have made, you know, I made half a million dollars last couple of months. So, right. you know, I mean, it'll work out for you. Yeah. I, we was at MTV after we had did the record. I remember just being up there for some random reason. We were standing in the hall. He's walking down the hallway. People just going crazy. And I didn't speak, you know, again, I don't know him. He just blessed me. And he turned around and say, hey, man, you ain't gonna holler at me. He said, shit, I put you on my song and everything. I was like, I was like oh, shit. I was like, bro, I just wasn't trying to stop you. He said, man, these people. Huh. He said, you, and it really just showed me respect it. Yeah. Me as an MC and as a man. And, and, and it showed me, too, how to put the bullshit on pause. Right. It didn't get back right to it. And not the bullshit like it's not good for you, just no. this is the business and the promotion of it. Right. This is me taking time to encourage a young black man Who's, who's, who's taking steps to improve it, and I see something in him. And, and he's always been that for me, you know right, what I mean? Like, so. and, and, and I, 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 I respect and appreciate it. Puff has been another person, man. Right. You know, Pitt don't always have the best reputation. I've never done business with him, but mm -hmm. what I've done was be courted for business, and I've had some business conversations in which he's helped me right. understand, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. coming out of street environments where my mom you know, she, my mom hated the concept of a record deal because it was a front, Right. you know, but she understood at this point, well, okay, your advice is kind of medicine, you know what I'm saying? But she was the one that told me, you always have to remain a man. You have to, you have to be willing to say no. Mm. You have to be willing to, to, to be contradictory in terms or to contrast what, what others, what the room may think sometimes. So I've appreciated these people who are considered moguls and are moguls giving me any, I don't care if it's two sentences, or two hours talks, it's all helped me. Yeah, for sure. You know, so I just, I say that, you know, cause as black men, man, sometimes we just be, be quiet and just listen. Like God yeah. sending the answers, might not be the way we want it, right. but God sending the answers. Yeah, I mean, and mentors and, and, and you know, big bros and all yeah. that is like so important, you know, in, in, in the game or just in life. I'm not gonna even say in the game, in life, you yeah, know what I mean? Life, like, life is the game. Life is the game, that's real, <laughs> you, you, you ain't lying. And so, you know, it's just so important for us to have like these people that are able to like, give us you know like like this game and and and, and help us to you know navigate you yeah. know and it's not always gonna be the people you like that's true like like you can you can i, I see people man i one of the, one of the best people this is my friend yeah i love him to death you know when i look at a, a ti a lot of people don't and pretend not to like him mm -hmm. that still don't stop the fact this man built 143 affordable housing units on the same street he used to trap on yeah so and you're not like of him and you're disparaging mm -hmm. of him don't forget to do like you do for them white folks. Hmm. You talk all that shit, but you carry money in your pocket, and you know they own slaves. You don't burn your money for protest. Yeah. So, and that goes to the 180th degree. Mm -hmm. You look at people like the good brother Charleston White. A lot of people don't like him. Hmm. Some of the advice that you've been trying to give your kids for years, and they wouldn't take, they're taking him because it's comedic or funny or whatever. Right. But so long as we get the message, you know, both black men, diametrically opposed sometimes, yeah. but both have a certain amount of merit and value that all my community needs. I don't care which savior follow. It could be Jesus or John the Baptist, as yeah. long as it's leading y'all ass to heaven. Right. You know, and I, so oftentimes when people don't like me, that's fine. If we have the same goal, mm -hmm. you know, just let us work it do our little bit because if we all do our little bit nobody got to do a lot yeah no that's real i mean it's interesting because you know people people's approach can you know kind of turn you off from their message yeah if you let it if you let yeah. yeah so you know for instance like with me and charleston white like uh you know i have kind of a split you know feeling with him mm -hmm. because on one side i i really feel i feel some of his message but then on one side like sometimes i'm like all right he's a little too extreme a little too overboard and sometimes that weighs over you know, like, you know, some of the good maybe that he is doing. Yeah, or, I don't have no you know, opinion man. past what I just said. Some yeah. people, some people, it, 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 different messages have to hit. God gonna send you that message till yeah. you get that message. If you get that message from someone saying, I've served two terms in federal prison, hmm. 
don't do this because ultimately the cornerstone of who you are as a man should be your wife and your family. If that's the way you get the message, good. And, and, and if, if you get the message in the West Side way, well, a street nigga know a lot of big words, good. Or if you the kind of nigga that, that don't love learning, if you the kind of nigga that ain't thought much, you don't want to think much, you just want to be told the opinion, there's, a, there's another guy on the other side who's hyper intelligent. I yeah. know, I, you kind of know who you are. And a person who's an organizer and thought black people was going to rally around the proper organ, and then you get heartbroken because you see they not. Yeah. So you, you create a character that's a gesture to antagonize and tease because you know just like standing in front of the store watching a junkie, a lot of times that's where our level of learning is. Hmm. And I've learned just as much standing in front of a store on the west side from a junkie who failed at everything as I did from the college professor who lived in the same community that succeeded, that I learned from the dope boy who learned his way and turned into a businessman. Yeah. I'm just saying, whatever school you go to, learn something. So yeah. I don't have any critique or criticism for any black person on any of these things, but you know, I see in here all the other shit that we see in here. But whatever, you know, some little cousins, I have to, I have to talk to in a niggardly way. Mm -hmm. Oh, motherfucker, the fuck, why don't you see your goddamn daddy fucked yeah. up? And then you're gonna break your mama hard, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And then there's others where you say, hey, I know you had a bad semester, I understand, but you can't do this to your mother. She's worked too hard to get you here. And we know that shit, I've been inside. I'm the nigga, they had to talk both ways to me. Hmm. You know you what know, I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm at goddamn, I'm at, I'm at Morehouse in the same year. My uncle said to me, hey man, what the fuck is wrong with you? You finna leave school? You know, so I've been them both. So I empathize and sympathize with both. And I think I understand, but yeah, I don't have any critique or criticism. I'm just citing the example that Word. somebody's Word. gonna give you the message, the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. That person may look like the nigga that's standing in front of the stove. Mm -hmm. That nigga may look like the nigga that owns a fucking, uh, owns a skyscraper, but get the message. Yeah, nah, absolutely. Cause I mean, just in the same vein of what you're saying, I mean, I can say that like, I didn't learn some of the best game ever on 22nd and Townsend, where I grew up at in Milwaukee. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's a guy feel city. Yeah, a lot of people it? don't know about Milwaukee. No, Players and pimp shit, they ain't making money off products. Yeah, nah. The human being was the product. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a hell of a mind. Yeah. So you ain't growing up around nobody stupid. Nah, come on now. Man. You got to know how to how to talk to folks, how to maneuver, how to, you know what I mean? Yeah. And living in like a, you know, a, a very segregated city. Absolutely. It's interesting because when you talk about, you know, growing up in Adamsville, the West Side, and like living like that full black experience, mm -hmm you know what I mean, your whole life, going to school and everything. I, I, I can say I live the same way, except for the one part that was interesting to me. And maybe you felt, saw this too. When I went to the doctor, oh yeah, they was all white. No. <laughs> when we went to the bank, no. they was, you know what I mean? No. And, and no. so that's the interesting thing about for, living in, you know, yeah. one of yeah. the top segregated cities yeah, in the U.S. Well, yeah. that's why I had to realize, in doing interviews and shit, people misunderstanding or, or not understanding the fuck I'm saying. Because I didn't understand that this wasn't everywhere. Wow. You know, in my family in Tuskegee, we owned a farm. I remember asking my grandmother, I said, yo, what would happen if the Ku Klux Klan with a K? You know, you fuck around, watch Roots or some crazy shit, yeah. you get to ask your parents yeah. crazy, ask questions. Yeah. And black families used to watch all that kind of shit together. Mm -hmm. I said, mom, what would happen if the Klan would have? She said, shit, yeah. That was going to go back on that laying down on them horses. My dad had, you know, shotgun at the window. So I'm just like, oh, shit, like, black people been not scared. Right. My neighborhood was not a neighborhood that was segregated or redlined. My neighborhood was a neighborhood in which black people gentrified. They say, poor white people, we're gonna pay you a 30% markup. You guys can go on out to Mableton, you know, to Spurney, go to Marietta, but we're gonna fortify this. You, they start schools like the Carrie Heights Elementary School, Frederick Douglass High School. Mm -hmm. Our rival high school is Benjamin E. Mays. Benjamin E. Mays, the president of Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. So this, when I say my whole world was black, yeah. my entire world was black. Not that white people didn't exist, right. but it was black dominated. So my bank, yeah, did my grandmother have a national bank account? Yeah, but my grandmother also had Citizens Trust. Mm. Citizens Trust is a black bank here, almost 100 years old. I've been with them since I was five years old. My mm -hmm. sisters are, are with them, my children are with them. Um, when I went to the doctor, Dr. Dr. Otis Smith, first pediatrician, um, I think black pediatrician here, went to Morehouse College, mm. had brought his clothes in his bag, he told me later, in, in garbage bags. Dr. Otis Smith was, was my doctor. Wow. So everything, Southwest Community Hospital was a black hospital. I, even though I was born in Grady, my aunt worked at Southwest. Gotcha. Southwest black hospital. So I'm used to seeing black doctors. This is a city where if a child sees a Lamborghini or a Bentley pass by, they expect to see a black person in it and not necessarily a single or a rapper. Hmm. So Atlanta has been a place, Post Maynard, who's our first black mayor, has been a place where politically the landscape looked like me. 
and economically it even grew. But even before that, when my granddaddy moved here in 1940, what Hunter Street was, what the Fifth Ward was, what John Wesley Dobbs, who was Maynard's grandfather, and you guys out there Google this shit I'm talking, because yeah. I ain't just talking shit. Yeah. You know, when I say name people like Herman Russell, when I name people like Alonzo Herndon, when I'm naming people, you, you know, we're celebrating Pinky Cole and, and her man Derek getting married this Saturday. Big Dave Cheesecakes, um, um, the um, was it, Slutty Vegan. Mm. I'm not surprised because mm. that's what Atlanta's been doing 120 some odd years. Wow. So imagine a kid growing up with that kind of confidence. Come on. That's it. Like I know I did. I saw white people. They would hold political positions. Mm -hmm. I knew white money funded. And I knew partnership in terms of because I understood capitalism pretty mm -hmm. early. You know, when I got a lawnmower and negotiated getting paid twenty dollars versus six sixteen. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I get this concept. So I knew that there was opportunity here. I knew it wasn't fair. Mm -hmm. From the time I asked my grandfather, you know, say I told him I said, well, this ain't fair. He said, yes, right. Life ain't fair. Yeah. Some some black folks that went to the elite colleges gonna have some advantages your black ass don't. But they can't learn better. Mm. So your black ass better learn all you can. Yeah. So you can have communication with these people who went to the elite colleges and you can do business. Might take you five years longer, might take you ten years longer, but if you do your job right, your children not gonna have to have that weight. Mm. And I saw this with other black people. I saw what class meant, what structure. So for me, yeah, man, this is this shit is special. Yeah. You know, when I say I'm a product of black power working. I mean it. It does not mean we perfect, mm -hmm. but it means it fucked around and worked here. Mm -hmm. I didn't have three white teachers my whole life. I haven't went to an institution named for a white person. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Every mayor my daughter has ever seen and I've ever seen has looked like me. Mm -hmm. Every mayor that has been mayor of this city has lived within eight miles of the house I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I just bought my daughter a house in the same neighborhood I grew up in. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's important to keep that because if we keep that in Atlanta, we can keep our part of Birmingham, we can keep our part of Mobile, we can keep our part and improve Jackson, Hattiesburg, mm -hmm. Charlotte, Columbia, Tampa, Daytona, Jacksonville, Savannah, Macon. When you do that, you form those strong economic political centers. Economic first, take mm -hmm. care of your coin in your house and in your neighborhood. If you do that, <laughs> you form this little web of cities that work for black people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so your homecoming at FAM makes money for the entire town. Your homecoming for Tuskegee makes money for the entire town. Mm -hmm. Your concert series that comes to Savannah, um, Atlanta makes money for the entire town. I don't mean just the singing and dancing part, you know? So that's, that's yeah. what I grew up seeing. That's what I still like to see. My, 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 my ambition is to see black people get so free, we ain't gotta say nobody holding me back. Word, and that makes sense too, and, and makes sense as to why like, you know, I always like your message is always to make black people understand like their, you know, like their civic, you know, empowerment and, you know, engagement or like, you know, understanding like our electoral power. Yeah, really, you got a shot. Like, I'm just not the nigga coming around this time to vote. The niggas who come around this time to vote, they're the niggas that talk bad about me because hmm. I get in the way of their check. Yeah. They get, a, they get paid from a party to be lap dogs to do what they told to do. That's why I follow Tesla and Figaro. Mm -hmm. She ain't nobody's lap dog. Hmm. Tesla does exactly what's good for the people what's, uh, as she sees it. Right. And she stays hyper-local on the issues that are hyper-local and she helps people focus that way. I don't know what should be done in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I don't know what should be done in Houston. Right. I don't know what should be done in Charlotte, Jackson. I don't live there. So I ask. I ask. Mm -hmm. I talk to the people who work in there. But in Atlanta, I know what's going on because right. I talk to Gary Davis. I talk to, you know, at Next Level Boys Academy. I talk to Christy at Georgia Youth Bill. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I, am, I am getting informed. You know, I'm doing what Stokely Carmichael did. I'm going around getting informed by the people doing the work, and I'm helping to mobilize. Mm -hmm. But Stokely challenged us to always organize. So when you see me stand in front of a podium, say, plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize, that ain't just some shit I made up as a rapper. That's a bar. That's for how you actually push toward progress right. in either way you want to. Right. You're going to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and then mobilize. Mm -hmm. Make it happen. But you, we should be <clears throat> in a constant state of organization. Yeah. You know, and since we don't go to church as much, since, you know, people not joining lodges, since people aren't are doing even social clubs, we don't have a chance as black people to just get in a room, 10, 12, 15 of us, and just talk and see what will help the West Side and how do we do that. And if we focus on that and let's argue and trying to put each other down and show each other up on the Internet, we can actually make some progress. And then you fuck around, you make a little progress in Atlanta, mm -hmm. we can emulate that progress in DeKalb. We can emulate their progress in Douglasville. We can emulate their progress in City of South Fulton. And then that progress starts to come together when you're a stronger force politically mm -hmm. and economically. So my thing is just whatever you do, try to do your little bit to help us all out to get it to understand it so we all won't have to do a lot. But yeah, I'm not, I just, I wanna, the day that I made the speech, 
I was smoking weed, good weed too, with Noriega. We had the Bankhead Seafood truck out there. Oh man, we was popping. You know, shouts out to my wife and Crystal for, for getting that Bankhead Seafood going. The building is actually getting built. Oh, right. But yeah. man, right oh, there, yeah, we were just a food that. truck. We was a bunch of rappers. We had some more <laughs> right there smoking. And Tip, you know, came to say, hey, the mayor's office just called me. They, um, that the peaceful protest is pivoting. Some other people have kind of showed up, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody didn't look like us to showed up with masks on, stuff starting to burn. And I'm like, shit, if you are standing in front of the CNN Center, left this way a quarter mile, it's the neighborhoods we grew up in. Mm. Let's, I mean, about a mile, I'll give you a mile. Mm. It's, it's literally the neighborhoods we grew up in. Mm. The neighborhoods I still own properties in, the neighborhood my cousin still live in. You're talking about Vine City, the Bluff, Dixie Hill, Simpson Road, Carolina. That's a four miles, that's our neighborhood. Now they're not gonna let you go north. Now we all, they gonna let you go north. Yeah. Now the Chamber of Commerce gonna make sure that shit don't happen. Mm. Going west that way, I mean going east that way ain't nothing to, to burn more concrete. So really naturally I'm thinking, well damn, the only pivot is they're gonna be down the force. So reluctantly, I go, my friend said, well, if you go, I ain't going. I'm just like, nah, you can't let your partner down. You say you're going to ride, you got to ride. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm down there, I got a quarter pound of fucking weed. I'm just like, God damn. We going in here and I'm seeing a mayor that's looked at as genteel, you know, kindly, you know, nice woman. She the pretty girl. She, she went to Frederick Douglass. She was like a North Star red. She, the, mm -hmm. you know, she was from the West Side. She fraternized with all that bullshit, yeah. right? I saw her tough as nails behind the scenes, mm -hmm. telling that chief and those folks to hold. We're not going to send people in on there yet. Just to, you know, and I'm just like, oh shit, this shit just turned into Hill Street Blues. The fucking mayor going crazy. Yeah. And, and in a good way. And they get us up there, Tip says something, and then he calls me, and I'm just like, I, I was just coming to show solidarity with you. I didn't expect to. Right. But my friend knows me, and my friend knows I'm a hell of an orator because I simply try to tell the truth mm -hmm. in a way that a third grader will understand with the honesty and passion I have. And I stood up there and I just told the truth, I didn't want to be there. I, 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 and, but, but I felt compelled to be there because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, it was crazy to me, I wanna, I'm gonna read this right quick, just because okay. there's some, always some debate about that, but there's this white kid, man. It tripped me out, he tattooed this shit on his fucking leg. Huh. And for people who oftentimes try to give their opinion of, of what I said that day, but. The message was plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize, right? Mm -hmm. But I said this during the speech, so anybody who wonders, I don't mind being questioned about the speech, because ultimately this is all I was saying to Atlanta. Because mm -hmm. if you weren't from Atlanta, I wasn't talking to you. You can out from Atlanta, you from, you from an all-black enclave in Milwaukee, yet all your doctors and teachers and shit like that was white. I don't even understand that fucking concept. Yeah. And, and, so, so someone from Atlanta talking to you is talking to other Atlantans. Yeah. I say, it is your duty not to burn your house down for anger with an enemy. It is your duty to fortify your own house so that, may you, that you may be a house of refuge in times of organization. Uh. A human being got that tatted on their leg. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Wow. So I don't got time to fuss about no nigga and what they think or yeah. some, some white liberal elitist who thinks I should have said something. Burn it all down. Yeah, yeah but bitch, you're going to go back down for red and leave. Right, right. This I'm, shit burned all down. We right next to the fucking bluff. Yeah, we right. You, you get what yeah. you, you, you it, was, it was a similar type of thing in Milwaukee some years back. I happened to be home visiting, and uh, I remember a cop ended up getting killed up there. Yeah. And, man, they burned, like, a bunch of the streets down, a bank down, the tire shop, like, all that. <laughs> like, all on Burleigh and all, like, all the, yeah. all the black neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying? But then, like, it was, like, a couple of things. Like, the main bank didn't get burned down. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, and then you could, you know, your real, your 90s mind, your conspiratorial mind, could you like, man, they just let this shit burn down to undervalue our property, come in and buy it cheap. Yeah. You gotta think like that. Elijah Muhammad, you know, Nation of Islam, man, my, my tenure with learning and reading their, their things as a teenager helped me. It helped me understand you have to study your enemy. Like, y'all bought the art of war to learn that. Yeah. Elijah Muhammad had already told me that. Huh. When, when you have an enemy, you think it's about race and about color and about. Man, this shit is down to the dollar. They, they enslaved each other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they brought you in slaves. And then you, don't, you think that duplicitous mind stops? The west side of Atlanta has been underappreciated hmm. for years. I never thought I'd see half a million dollars, $750,000 on Bankhead. Hmm. Would that have been possible if the property values were high? No. So there was an interest in making sure or, or allowing it mm -hmm. to stay low. One of the, another thing I got to get Keisha Lance Bottoms um, props on. She really upped the affordable housing, making sure people could stay. She put a right. moratorium on 
house taxes for other people. Andre came in, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of our mayors for doing what they can because there's juggernauts of corporations and monies that come into cities. Yeah. And all too often, cities just sell you out. Right. And at least you have mayoral ship in this, in this town that's made sure something was in it for you, Absolutely. that you profited in some way. Um, $40 billion came through this town um, during Andy's tenure as mayor in terms of the Olympics. He made sure $11 billion went directly to the black community. Wow. Now, you can say we deserve a half, but shit, I'll take a quarter. Hey, come on. Yeah, I'll take you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, you, you, before you get to the houses, you're serving quarters. Before you get to the quarters, you're serving nicks and dimes. Mm -hmm. But make sure you're in the game serving when it's making money. Time. Nah, absolutely. And you always uh, stood on, like, with the pol on the political side, you know, um, being independent mm -hmm. and then also challenging black people yep. to understand like the power of you, their electoral power but then also you know um not just jump into the democratic side like mm -hmm. when uh you know bernie sanders um didn't you know make it further in the race like standing on that and challenging black people to not just be democrats because that's what folks be are telling us to be whatever it take you to be to be free hyper locally yeah I'm not arguing no national shit with you. Hyper locally. Yeah. If you in Utah hmm. and being whatever it take to win, help you hmm. win, to help whatever small percentage of black people there, you in Colorado, yeah. do that. And All I right. want the greater community to understand when I advocate for helping and having a strong black economy, it's, it's not at the peril of anyone else. Hmm. Atlanta will show you when there's a strong black economy, everything else prospers. Hmm. Barranco Pontiac sold a lot of cars. Black company yeah. sold a lot of cars because there's a true black working class and middle class here. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a Barranco Pontiac, do you get some of the sponsorship that we've had for HBCUs? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the Miss Barbara owning the Exxon and my grandmother exclusively going to the Exxon, who would have funded Collier Heights Trojans uniforms? Do you get what I'm saying? It's just a simplicity, but the wider audience has understood it. In other words, white wow. folk. Yeah. When black folks got money, we spend money with corporations too. Yeah. And that keeps you in jobs and that oh, yeah. keeps you having mortgages. At the end of the day, James Baldwin said, I know we're going deep for the push, you know what I mean? But hey, come on, I was on that, I was on, when I was serving Jay, a lot of DJs had been to college. They hit me to some shit that I hadn't even known about. Huh. My, my thug ass art teacher, God bless his soul, went to Book T. Washington. So he made sure even the thugs had a serve. You know, when you wonder why Tip used a big word, because yeah. he went to Frederick Douglass. Huh, and I, so, you know, <laughs> when, when, when you're looking at James Baldwin, said blacks and whites in this country are going to have to find some type of reconciliation in terms of they're going to have to get to understand each other because white people are not packing up and giving this country back to the natives yeah. uh, and going back to, to, to Europe. And certainly most African Americans who've, who've gave and shed blood from a family standpoint that have been here they're not going, i'm not giving up my land in tuskegee you know yeah. what i'm saying so we're gonna have to figure this out and white folks don't have to stop being scared of black folks getting their just due because when we get our just due it makes the econ economy more robust money gets to mm -hmm. turning mm -hmm. as blacks we just need to learn to turn that dollar in our community more yeah. first you know yeah, nah, that, that's definitely important. Like, yeah, handling it locally. Local, and hyper then, local. Yeah, I mean, that, that even come to like, you know, when, when people get to talk about, oh, black people need to do this, need to do that. It's like, yo, handle this within your family and get that <laughs> discipline and that man. structure on point. Man. And then you can influence man. so many other that's people what, that way rather than trying to like solve it by the masses. Come on, man. You know it's I mean? just that self-discipline. Yeah, man. First, like, oh, man, I'd have managed to lose some weight, man. If, Damn, boy, you be wanting to eat out the night. It's like, shit, really, if I just hold out, I couldn't. If I, yeah, could get, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Um, yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to hit the boxing class with you and Bear. I'm trying to improve my self-discipline self because the stronger as we are as individuals, the stronger links will be in the chain. Absolutely. That's, that's with one another. Absolutely. And, and the more fair the world will have to treat us because we'll be using our leverage correctly. You yeah, know what I'm yeah. saying? That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't vote Democrat. I'm not saying right. leave the Democratic Party. I'm saying, hey, you got to give us something. Yeah. And I don't mean a Juneteenth concert. Right. We need right. something right. that economically gives us advantage or the leverage to deal fairly with other groups of people that we're doing business yeah. with. And if, if black men are going into trucking as felons, you can get into trucking, then we need some guarantee that if we're 13% of the population, we have 13% of the government contracts in trucking. Yeah. If, we, if, if I talk to a billionaire white friend of mine, he says, you know, I can't. I, I don't have a problem with black folks owning teams, uh, us knowing that new team owners are going to be coming up. It's no problem as we expand. He said, but I sure would like to see black people make up 13% of the, of the population of finance serves hmm. and financiers in this country. Imagine how life changes. Man. If 13% of Wall Street are from people who came from Milwaukee. 
Birmingham, Oakland, California. Come on. You know, Compton. Yeah. You know, not only not only you got to be a, br a brilliant brother like my brother Rendell, who used to work for the brother um, Robert Robert Smith, another brilliant brother, black brother, billionaire, right? But you have the savvy to say everybody else is saying government reparations, government reparations. Why we to arguing that? Let me go over here and say corporations never stop making money because hmm. that money compiled, compiled. So let's put a two percent tax. I was like, God damn, fucking genius. But if he never becomes a billionaire, if he never understands that game, if he's not a kid that understands the street game and say, hey, I'm gonna just put a 2%, then how do we get that, that, that genius of an idea? So let's, let's trust ourselves. Yeah. And let's individually get strong and let's link up. And it works for me. I'm not an either or. On the same street I grew up on, the current mayor mm -hmm. lives, right? That same street, one of the, one of the, the biggest black um, you know, players who ever lived in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know what I'm saying, yeah. Li lived there, the numbers man, the moonshine man. Yeah. The same street, these working class black folks, the same street, U.S. congressmen, senators, policemen, but it was all black. Mm. It was all us. Yeah. And everybody donated to them civil rights marches mm -hmm. and campaigns. You know, and that's what we don't have to understand, that we need to get offline arguing and get in our rooms by ourselves and talk with one another. And that means yeah. if we do it and, and say, like you say, family, let me get up, make my own bed. Let me make sure my house clean. Let me make sure I get my family here. Yeah. Let's get my dope boy cousin, make sure he got some life insurance yeah. in case the worst should happen to his children. Let's get my cousin who a lawyer to say, hey, you need to tell your cousin why he need to get out this game and what right. he could do. Right. Let's get our cousin that's a nurse to say, hey, how does the family need this? Let's use everything we have within us. Right. And I'm not saying this as a hypo hypothetical. Right. I'm telling you this is what the fuck my family did. Yeah. yeah. You know, I remember being a little kid, all your old ladies would be in a room and this when crack is at its height, people dying. Our grandmother, whoever could write cursive, our grandmothers and aunties, they had a sign it like our cousins. They'd be like, what this for? And later we found out about life insurance. Uh -huh. That our cousin out there living wild, he don't have no damn life insurance. And his mama said, well, you're gonna have some life insurance. Here, boy, you're not writing cursive, Michael. Here, there you go. Hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So my, well, my, my cousin died, my cousin didn't, didn't have to wait to be buried. Right. He didn't have to be cremated. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those are the things that I think that I've seen in my life work. And I haven't seen everything. Mm -hmm. You know, but I've seen enough to know to give some solid advice and I'd like for us to return to that place. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, the most difficult thing about discipline is, you know, not, you know, knowing the outcome yet. So it's yeah. like as you're through the process, you know what I'm saying? You're not seeing it yet. But then yeah. once you get there, yeah. it's like, you know, hindsight is 2020. It's like, oh, that was easy. Damn, I wish I would have, you know, been yeah, there. The, the true you know? joy for me, though, has been the journey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they say the person who enjoys the walk, well, um, will have a more beautiful experience than a person just who enjoys walking to the destination. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, no, the journey I, is everything. As I walk now, as I do my little three miles. <laughs> oh, I can dig it. See, that's, that's the same memory. tip I'm on, man. Shout out to Big Bank Black, too, man. Black yeah, I've been seeing Black, Black, Black. Yeah, and he's, on, and he's biking and all that, too. It's so beautiful. My man Bear is biking. He's got Word. me into it. So, man, I just. Yeah, you know what? Bear <laughs> I, Bear been talking to me about biking for like a year or so. Yeah. Now, I, I'm finally at that point. I'm ready. You know what I mean? Ready to get it in. So That's about why I'm too. I ran from it a long time. Man, let's get it, bro. For real. Yo, so so tapping back into the music, bro. Um, so, you know, you put out, uh, what was it? Uh, rap music 11 years ago. Well, rap music. Yeah. But then what I want to tap into was gangster music. Oh, <laughs> the, the compilation, you know, because you know, you put on um, some dope artists in the same vein of how, you know, you came in, it was like you went ahead and, you know, gave, gave some folks that alley-oop. So, you yeah. know, folks like S.L. Jones, yeah. a.k.a. Cuz Lightyear, Lightyear you yeah. know, he's DGB fam. Uh, Gangsta Peel, a.k.a. Pillar Light, my yep. boy Peel, mm -hmm. much love to him, you know. Um, and so, I mean, can you just talk about, you know, you using uh, your platform to, yeah. you know, put cats on and, and still to this day doing that? Man, first of all, let me tell you, Nickel played a Nario from Grind Time and Peel have done a few songs together. They shot some visuals. Man, them boys still going hard Word. as ever. So support that boy Nickel Play the Nario yes, and Gangs uh, Appeal because they still out there. And you, it, 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 I'm going to tell you, man, a barbershop talk. Everybody ain't got to like everybody. But if that's your dog, ride for your dog and support it. Play yeah. it around your kids, your partners and shit. And help your, help your folks own, own a community. Get 300 people in a room and y'all enjoy Peel. You know what I mean? Yeah, really enjoy so. Nickel Play the Nario. So shout out to them boys. Cuz has been A&R you know, forever. He's yeah. just so... You know, it, music just drips out of drips mm -hmm. out of him, man. And um, all the grind time tapes, um, in terms of you know, pledge allegiance to the grind, um, pledge allegiance to the grind too. I think even Bang, he was an, he he A and R. He was mm -hmm. so when it came time to do Michael, he and I, I had um, 
we had got up to Mass Appeal. He put out an amazing project, featured Lil Baby, other people. Um, you know, people, 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 people fought with it. Yeah. Just didn't have the capacity in terms of money to make it even grow. I remember being in Vegas, high as a motherfucker, pulled up, uh, Hellcat pulled up to me, painted like a taxi, beating mm. the shit out of that cuz like, yeah. yeah. I called him on crazy, like, nigga, you in Vegas, niggas. Yeah. And um, after that, I was like, okay, well, let's just do a mixtape, because I want your name to get right back out there. So we'll just do a villain's mixtape. Mm -hmm. Callum is inspired by, like, Re-Up and that, that guy and that type shit. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was kind of some hard villains, dark shit. But I had these records um, that led to Michael Cousins. Like, I'm going to pause my career, and I'm going to A&R. This is my goal. And wow. two years later, like, you know, what a better show of brotherhood. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, my guys are still around out there beating. That's Mazzetti, yeah. Chaotic Beats, who's the original um, producer, has life, life in prison, but we fighting hard to... You know, I hope that's not his natural life because yeah. he's, he's such a good man. He's mm -hmm. such a God fearing man. He made one horrible mistake, but it, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't take him away the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And Smith and Cash, other producers, the kids that came from St. Kitts and gave us that sample sound, you know, Smith's up in Canada, Cash is here. Mm -hmm. um, so my, the guys are good, man. Shouts out to Bill Collector, Big yeah. Key, who let us have his house to sleep on the floor mm. to record that grind time. We was in Gwinnett. Before Gwinnett was officially recognized as NOF, you know what I mean? Yeah. We was up there in Gwinnett sleeping on the floor. I remember Bear coming up there. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I'm just like, man, this is the way. And at the same time, I'm turning out like over 100 grand yeah. in a new car from Virgin but to believe in the grind. So I'm going to tell y'all, G-R-I-N-D, get rich independently. Believe in the grind. Grind right. time, rap, game, bang, bang, bang. Because it gave me a mentality a no quitter mentality. So, yeah. you know, support your folks, man, your local folks. Right. Around That's what's up, man. That's what's up, man. Shout, shout out to all of them, man. And we yeah. got to get Cuz Light here on the porch. We oh, man, I, if I would have known, man, I me mean, and Cuz, we got to get him on the porch yeah. and we got to do one together because yeah. we, we got some stories, man. Absolutely. So there was a reason to come back. We'll yeah. talk Michael after the record. That's man. what's up. That's what's up. So, man, can you talk about uh, recording Ready, Set, Go? Uh, do you, like, do you, do you remember, like, that session? I don't remember the whole session, but this is what I remember. J.D., who is an, a white boy out of West Georgia, mm -hmm. amazed my brother, amazing human being, is one of the best engineers that I, that I had worked with, and, um, and, the, and the industry was driving him crazy. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand it, that artists are addicts and flawed and fucked up, and he didn't understand why we wouldn't take advantage of all our shit, because most of us were fighting off some kind of depression and shit. Yeah. We would frustrate the shit out of him to the point that he got frustrated and started beating himself up with mm -hmm. drugs and drinking and stuff. JD left music, went down to West Georgia College, started studying some crazy shit like neuroscience or something. Mm -hmm. Has just scholarshiped into another major university, is in Tibet right now, training in fucking kickboxing and shit. One of the healthiest, you know, most, most just heartfelt human beings ever. And he's an example to me daily, like you can change your life anytime you decide to. So let me give shouts out to JD, because JD was the guy who was the, he was the, he was the minority whip in that. You know, he's the only little white kid, Southern, grew up on ball and G, Juvie, mm, Outkast, mm -hmm. new as shit. You know, it's a, you know, if you get in the entertainment industry, there's certain white boys that are authentically yep. Southern and get it, you know yep. what I mean? Yep. They Almond Brother Southern. Yep, absolutely. And um, JD was like, <laughs> you know, ID gave us the beat, and JD was like, oh, nah, you, you gotta do this. You gotta get tip on this shit. Yeah. And Cause, I don't know if Cuz was around yet, but I know, yeah, I think he might have been. But I know JD was really the whip that was cracking. Mm -hmm. We got that motherfucker done, man, and I knew it was money. Yeah. And when we shot the video, shouts out to um, Motion Fam, the mm -hmm. fucking video, the black and white, the, the inner dry cleaners, this before paid in full. Right, like right. You get what yep. I'm saying? This is like, woo. So, man, that's one of my, my favorite records to have done, to perform. And, Hopefully I get big enough one day I get to throw a big State Farm Arena concert Word. and me and, and I, Tip do it for And I forgot life. that Motion Family shot that. Yeah. Yeah, man. Them, them dudes is legends as well. Always. You know I mean, no, for sure. So, um, with, so with the new album, Michael, um, you know, you said that this is your most, like, introspective yes, project? Yes, absolutely. It's most, my, most transparent. Word. You know, I, my, Killer Mike is a hero that, like, the nine-year-old version of Michael created, the mm -hmm. kid with the horns and halos badass rapper, he don't never lose, talk yeah. that shit. And all boys need that. Mm -hmm. All boys need adventure, danger. Mm -hmm. You know, for some boys it's Kung Fu, Jiu Jitsu, for some boys it's riding a bike or skateboard, for some boys it's the big three, baseball, you know, football, um, you know, uh, basketball. And with rap, it's a pugilistic form of poetry. Yeah. Badass. Right. Michael is who this little nine year old boy is, is the man as he evolves into masculinity. Mm. The babies, the baby mamas, the ups, the letdowns, the getting, 
accepted in the best college for black men in the world, to choosing to drop out, mm -hmm. to understanding how his mistakes had affected women he thought he loved but didn't love enough, how his first love, a teenage love, and the heartbreak from an abortion have affected him, mm -hmm. you know, what it, what it feels like to have empathy as a dope boy on something for junkies, what it's like to hang with your dope boy homeboys with yeah. currency and spitter, you know, in spaceship views. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like driving that brand new old school, you know. Yeah. Exit 9, which is named for the Adamsville exit off 285 is a Martin Luther King exit, which takes you through the gambit of what a Martin Luther King Jr. drive is, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It feels like a, our version of it, today was a good day, right. you know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, I take you through the full range. I just challenge people to download it mm -hmm. um, and listen to it start to finish. Mm -hmm. In a room, smoking and joking, or drinking some wine by yourself with you and your old lady or you and your partners in the shop, mm -hmm. or just taking a 55 minute drive. You gotta go from one side of town to the other. Wow. And just, it's an audio movie. Yeah. Allow yourself to know the character. If you know me, you know Sleep. So when Sleep pop up in the song, you hear us being about, you know, going from shawty living naughty drinking 40s mm -hmm. to in the flame, day shift, diamonds, flawless in our 40s. Yeah. You, you get to travel that with, with me. You get to see the two 15 year old little knucklehead boys, car thieves, build drinkers, now respected men in their community and business owners and in the same club. And now we're in the day shift. Mm -hmm. We ain't in the night shift no more. We don't need to be seen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I could dig it. I could dig it. Man, I done, I done bumped into you a few times uh, in that blue flame. Too, yeah, that's my neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's where I grew up. That's, that's where my sisters yeah. live. That's random where day shift, the random home. night. Like I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I'd be in there for real. Yeah, straight <laughs> up. And not even on the whole trip. Just like, man, if I want some wings, man, I don't feel like going to Northside Drive. Oh, man, I'm gonna stop my ass right here at the flame. Yeah. And if I'm if I'm really too tired and fucked around, got too stoned, I'm gonna call my sister. Say I'm outside in the driveway. Just yeah. I'm gonna sleep. Just check on me in a couple hours. Word, word. <laughs> no, I could dig it. I could dig it. So um, so so Mike, uh, you know, dope rap artist. Uh, community organizer, yeah. social activist, um, you know, uh, filmmaker as well as actor. Um, you know, when it's all said and done, man, like, what do you most want your legacy to, you know, be remembered as? And, and what are you shaping it towards? Easy. Willie Berkshire Wood, my grandfather, you know, had third grade education. His father abandoned him. He and his wife, my grandmother, raised three amazing children and me and my sister. And he said, don't embarrass yourself. If you do, you know, you get up, shake yourself off. If you fuck up, you apologize. Take care of you and your sisters. Next, don't embarrass me and your mama night. Hmm. My grandparents have worked very hard to build good names within the community. Don't run around doing the shit that will embarrass that. So the shit I got away with, thank God for. But I always worked under constraints. So I'm not embarrassing their name. And lastly, don't embarrass black folks. You know, he is old man. He might say, some days he might say Negro, some days he might say nigga, some days he might say colorful. <laughs> you depends on. It. And I'm going to work very hard to leave a good name mm -hmm. for myself, one that can be spoken honorable in any room, mm -hmm. because I don't want my sisters to hold their head down or my children to have to hold their head down. You know, a wife of or women who have children, I mean, hold their head down, and it was an honorable man. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want my grandparents' name and legacy to be ruined, so, you know, I want this city to know and speak my name in a high level because this city means a lot. You know, I look at, I view it, Atlanta as a black Israel of sorts. It, it, you, everybody don't have to agree, everybody has to be the same, but there's opportunity here for us. You know what I'm saying? In the same way that, you know, my, my friends, they, you know, my Jewish friends, I was, you know, I was rather kind of not, and then I went to the Holy Land and it transformed me. Atlanta feels like that to me. It is transformative. If I travel the world and come back home, I feel empowered the time I get off the plane. So I would like a good name in Atlanta. And, and ultimately, you know, I'm accepted beyond my people. And I think it's because I try my best to represent well for my people. And lastly, I'd like, you know, ultimately I'd like to be remembered as a good man, as a good black man, mm -hmm. as someone who brought credit to my community and not discredit and shame. And um, if I could pull that off, you know, keep a few millions of dollars so I can get help. <laughs> and my wife can live cool and my great grandchildren, if I got more than that, don't That's have to worry about anything. I, I feel like I've done my small part. Word. That's what's up, man. No, yeah. Definitely working towards that That's and definitely point. hitting all those those milestones. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Nah, for sure. That's what's up, man. Um, can you talk about, uh, you know, one of the biggest lessons, uh, you know, that Miss Denise, you know, your mom. Nisi, baby. yeah. My girl, Nisi Poo. Um, She, 
I miss her so much, man. Hmm. Like, I miss that girl so much, man. Just right. like. She. Nah, I get it, bro. Yeah, miss mine, too. Her. Miss my mama, too. Miss Roxy. Yeah, she so, gone. She wasn't going to accept nothing but a man. <laughs> Oh man, it was so ridiculous. I remember that because cause, you know, I have two gay uncles. Both my dad's youngest brothers are gay. So I was just like, okay, gay people exist. I mean, right. Big old deal. My mother had a white friend named Chuck who had the old 70s haircut, the porn stash and shit. Yeah. Chuck would be at our house on the Fridays party. And I was just looking at my dad like, the fuck is up with Chuck? But my mother helped me understand diversity. Was, it was just there. But I remember her saying the type of man she wanted me to be. Oh man. It was a culmination of all these great attributes from the men that I'd seen around me. Word. But, but she was so stern. Mm. And because she knew she loved me. My sisters always say, you know, your mom loved you best. Yeah. And she knew she spoiled me to a point. But she understood that I had to toughen up because one day she was going to leave. Right. And, oh. Man, that, that girl told me, she said, you know, you think your grandmother dying is the worst thing that could happen to you. She said, but I'm your mother. Mm. And when I'm gone, you're going to understand that. Wow. And man, that girl got out of here and it hit me. She gone. Yeah. And um, I, shit ain't been the same since. You know, shit ain't been bad. But um, shit ain't been bad. Shit's been great and good in terms of that, but I miss her. Right. Because ultimately what she was was my life coach because she wanted what was best for me no matter what. Mm. You know, I remember my wife sassed her one time. It was funny. What Shay says, you know, Mr. Niece, he want, uh, niece, Mama Niece, he want more than one woman. And I, she was, I mean, we were stoned. We had been smoked. She looked now, she said, and she never said no shit like this again. But she let it finally be known that she had raised. She says, I raised a, my son a king. Hmm. If he want 12 women, he can have it. As long as he can afford it and be there for them, each one the same. So not only did she tell my wife, I've raised a man that's never going to take on more than he can be accountable for. But telling me, if you're going to take on something, be willing to be accountable for it. Yeah. And that was her lesson. You want to sell dope? I don't want you selling dope. But if you want to sell dope, you're going to sell dope the right way. I'm going to tell every nigga I know, don't front you shit. If you got to start with a 50 or a 20, nigga, that's what you're going to start with. You're going to have to earn it. You have to get it. You ain't going to be nobody's. You ain't going to be begging no motherfucker. Yeah. And I saw how the guys who sold spoke her name highly. You would have thought they was talking about their own mom. Huh. And I understood that this is a woman of respect, and she's training me to be the type of man that she thought the world needed. Mm -hmm. I remember, man, she gave me one of the worst whoopings of my fucking life. Sixth grade, my smart ass coasted in Miss Sturgis class. I don't give a fuck. Sturgis, man, she old. Oh, she ain't really tripping. I got all C's. I brought them C's, man. My dad took me to Cumberland Mall. She was working at World Bazaar, arranging flowers and stuff, you know. He said, um, show her your report card. I showed her. She just all C's. I'm, I'm cool. You know what I mean? This halfway through the year. And she said, it's all C's. I look, I say, that's average. She looked at me, and I'd never seen a scowl on her face like that. She said, and I'm going to beat your average ass when I get home. Denise beat me till she was sweating. She said, I didn't have nothing average. God wouldn't send me nothing average. How dare you call yourself average? Let's just say my average increased <laughs> to A's and B's Come the on. second half. Yes, and I never looked at myself or used that as a cop out again. So honestly, I think the ultimate lesson was Michael, don't be average. Uh. Michael, you special. Yeah. Go to the aptitude. You serve the world no good by dimming your light yeah. so you can hang with your homeboys. Come on now. And um, she pushed that line on me. So, you know, Motherfuckers say, you think you smart? No, I know I'm smart. Because huh. I've, I've worked and read and Absolutely. did the research, and I've gotten failed enough times to be smart. Oh, you think you the shit? Yeah, I know I think I'm the shit. Yeah. And nigga, if I act like I'm light-skinned with curly hair, it's because my daddy light-skinned with curly hair. Huh. And nigga, I'm his son. <laughs> so, Real you know, and, and however you feel about Man. me, my, my, 
my confidence is intact. That woman made sure yeah. she left a man. You know, I said that in um, Mothers. I said, you know, they made sure they left the world a man like me. Mm -hmm. you know, and they did. Absolutely, man. I mean, it, man, it sounded like your moms and my moms, Miss Roxy, would have been Come best on, man, friends. Come on, Miss Roxy. <laughs> I'm telling you, because my mama on the same tip. Them see, my mama said, you can see your way out of my house. <laughs> them C's did not go yeah. uh, at all. So to that, yeah. Yo, black kids, y'all not average. Y'all nah, kids making this music, y'all not average. Y'all kids making these beats. Nah. At home, y'all not average. Y'all kids figuring this shit out. Without a studio, y'all not average. It's Absolutely. nothing average about you. If you're in media, if you're yeah, trying to do interviews, you're doing you. marketing, you're doing filmmaking, yep. you're doing anything. Yep. I was just down with a bunch of kids. Um, me and the chief of police, um, Sean Buchanan, um, he asked me to shoot a group of PSAs and at Tri-Cities High School. I think the Horn brothers are, 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 who are who've been mentoring those kids and helping them. Those kids are fucking pros. Theater kids were always pros. Yeah. But those kids put together a rope that filmed and directed us in the PSAs. And the PSAs were really simple shit. Mm. Like if you're going out and you're drunk, don't mm -hmm. let your friends drive mm -hmm. drunk. You know what one of them said, don't drink. It was like, we you know you teenagers. <laughs> you know your last yeah. don't get drunk. But they wrote it, the kids right. wrote it. So, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged, man. And again, y'all ain't average. Right. Nah, that's what's up, man. So uh, Mike, what else you got coming up, man? What else can we be expecting for you? For Album you? on the 16th. I'm go rehearse my ass off for the next 30 days after that. Or, or so, just under 30 days. Tour starts on July the 10th Okay. Um, in Birmingham. We got Birmingham, we got Atlanta, we got Charlotte. Um, we got to do about 28 dates. It's gonna be me and the Midnight Revivalers. That's a, the group of singers that I got coming out with me. Right. I, Lil Will, if y'all remember Lil Will. Okay, yeah. Lil Will finna come out and done it, and, and, uh, uh, so and, and be Will. the one lone male voice in there. Shouts out to the, to the sisters, man. It's gonna be an amazing, it's gonna be an amazing experience. Me and DJ Trackstar going out and um, we, we going on revival. Wow, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. Um, y'all come out, man. You know, if, if y'all want them folks say, Mike, man, my mama, my daddy love you, bring your mom and dad ass out. You're going to enjoy this motherfucker too. If you if you're a fan of Run the Jewels, bring your ass out. You know what I mean? Wow. If you're a fan of Killer Mike and, man, Mike, I've been waiting to do another solo album, dog, bring your ass out. Smoke with me, talk some shit, you know, and I hope that along the way some of my homies pop up. I'll do Atlanta. I think the third date. So, you know, CeeLo popped up at an event last night. I'd love for him to pop right. up. Dre and Future, if y'all want to pop up, you know what I'm saying? I'd <laughs> yeah, love for all the Atlanta yeah. artists, community, and more to come out. You know, when we go down to New Orleans, I'd love to see the homie Spitter, you know, pop up. All I right. go out West Coast, shouts out to Blast. He's on it, Ty Dollars on it. Right. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a hell of an album, and it's an experience. So, y'all come see it live. Yes, sir. That's what's up, It's man. not going to be a typical show. Yeah. And, 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 and any uh, last words you want to leave us with? Hey, man, I love and respect y'all all. Please check out my TV show, Love and Respect, where I get to do this, and I get to ask people questions. I think y'all enjoy it. And, um, you know, be the best one you can be, man, so you can link with the two, the three, and four. And, you know, we can, um, again, if everybody of us do, if all of us do a little bit, and nobody do a lot, so let's just do our little bit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Much love, man. I appreciate you. Love. I thank you, man. I appreciate y'all. Yes, sir. Love. All right. <laughs> My mama dead, my, mama my dead. grandmama dead. dead To keep it honest, I get depressed and be feeling scared You see, I won't prepare yeah. and never 